Pastor Jay Mansbridge here, lead pastors of Bayside Church International, based here on the south coast of South Australia. Our great passion as a church is to help people to know Jesus and to demonstrate His love, truth and life in everything that we do. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Uh, guys, again, greetings. It's uh, great to see you today, or see you uh, in the manner of speaking. It's, uh, I mean, we're thrilled that you've joined us today. And if you are not part of the Bayside family, maybe you're visiting here for a long weekend, or for some reason have come across this video, uh, we're thrilled that you have. My name's Chad Mansbridge, and I had the pleasure of being part of the leadership group here in this church, Bayside in Victor Harbour. And very, very soon, you will be able to be welcomed into our facility, and uh, we'd love to see you in the flesh uh, here at some point really soon. So things are certainly uh, moving along as we are coming into winter and uh, coming to terms with the reality of the situation that we've been facing in the last couple of months anyway. Uh, let's go. Today I want to share with you, as I said, a bit of a Bible lesson. Uh, I want to kick off a new uh, preaching series today for winter. But before we do that, I want to take you back a little bit to one of my favourite public holidays. Today's a public holiday weekend, as you know, but one of my favourite public holidays happens in January and it's the Australia Day long weekend of the Australia Day public holiday. Do you remember summer? Do you remember that? Do you remember all those months ago? It seems like so long ago, uh, but the Australia Day long weekend. And on the Australia Day long weekend, we were doing a preaching series here, a bit of a mini-series through summer, uh, which we simply called a mixtape series where basically we grabbed some sort of a well-known Bayside messages, okay, and uh, we put the mixtape together for summer, some classic Chad and Jay sermons over that time. Well, one of the ones I preached on the Australia Day Long Weekend uh, was called Culture Carriers. I was speaking about how Australia has a culture and every year we have people sign up as citizens of Australia uh, to say that they will commit to the culture of Australia. They've moved here, they've experienced something of Australian lifestyle, they embrace that lifestyle as they own, their own and then they commit themselves to expressing Australian culture through their life. And I said, well, guess what? We are not just citizens of Australia but we are citizens of heaven and our job as Christians is not just to experience the culture culture of heaven, what God is like, essentially, what his home is like. The only reason God's home is a certain way is because he's there, okay? We experience something of the nature of God. We embrace what he has for us, and we say, I'll take that, that's mine. And then we commit ourselves as carriers of heaven's culture to exhibit and express that culture everywhere we go, because we are not only Australian citizens, we are first and foremost those of us who are followers of Jesus. We are carriers of the culture of heaven. And one of the ways I thought, how would I express kingdom culture? What is, does kingdom culture look like? I tend to like to operate in threes. And so I picked this scripture here in Romans 14:7, 14, 14:17, 7, uh, 14, which describes the kingdom of God. It says it's not about what you eat or what you drink or what you wear and these sort of peripheral physical things. This is not what the culture of heaven is all about, measuring skirts and having the right clothes on and eating the right foods on the right days. And that's not really what heaven is about at all. Heaven is about this. It's about righteousness. It's about peace. And it is about joy in the Spirit. This is what God's domain is like. This is what God's house is like. This is what God's rule is like. And it is like this because this is what God is like. God is righteous. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. All right? Holy Spirit is the Spirit of joy. And when we come to Him, we experience these things from Him. Our second step is then to embrace those things as gifts to us. Righteousness is first and foremost God's nature. Secondly, it's a gift that He gives us. He calls us righteous. He declares us righteous. He gives us peace and He gives us joy. These three things are a gift to us. We are to experience God in these ways. We are to embrace these things as gifts for ourselves. And then thirdly, we too are to exhibit and express these qualities. We are to express righteousness in the way that we live and speak. We are to express peace in a world of troubled times. And we to are express and exhibit joy even when there is no outside reason to have joy. There is always a reason to be joyful when God lives on the inside of you. And so we sort of took these three words, righteousness, peace and joy, in summer, Australia Day long weekend, to encourage you to carry the culture of a kingdom. And I kind of want to revisit that a little bit today 
as we come to another public holiday weekend, the Queen's birthday today here in June. At the start of this year, Jay, my wife, had a word for us as a church. It was either late last year, I think maybe November, but it was for 2020. And she felt quite strongly uh, the sense of, uh, there was a whole picture of a, of a laughing lion, okay? And the word essentially was around the joy of the Lord being our strength. This was something that we really had to take note of for 2020, like a forewarning. Listen, for next year, you guys are going to have to learn, all right, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And half of us in the room heard that and went, joy, yes, that sounds like a great year. Half of us heard the word strength. And we were like, if God is telling us we need to be strong in 2020, then that means there's challenges coming our way. You only need to be strong when there's challenges. You only need to be strong when there's stretching. You only need to be strong when there's actually obstacles coming against you that you need strength for. So this was an encouraging word. It's also a warning word to say, you're going to need strength in 2020. And the key to living in the strength you're going to need is joy. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I thought at that time when I heard that, number one, we're going to be facing some challenges we need strength for. Number two, sometime in 2020, it would be good for us to do a series on the book of Philippians. Because the book of Philippians has one of the major themes of Philippians is joy. It's a little book, four chapters. I read it this morning in less than 10 minutes. All right, You can sit down, you read it like a letter. You can literally read it in 10 minutes. You just don't stop and think too much. Okay, You just read it as it is. You can literally do it in 10 minutes. But over and over again, about 16 times, the word joy, rejoice, rejoicing is mentioned. It's a major theme of the book of Philippians. Alongside of that is the theme, the gospel. You'll see that as you read the book over and over again, the happy gospel. Why can we rejoice? Because of the gospel. Another word that's repeated again and again is the word partnership okay joy good news partnership we're in it together okay these are kind of the themes of the book of philippians and so when jace spoke that word and it had a sense of a weight to it for this year i thought you know what sometime in 2020 we're going to be doing a series on the book of philippians i sense that will be a wise thing to cooperate with that prophetic word first thessalonians 5 says do not despise prophecy and the word there in the Greek you know, has a uh, despise can mean do not think lightly of. Do not treat something lightly. One of the things, if we have a culture of prophetic words coming thick and fast all the time, we treat them lightly, uh, lightly if we don't pause, ponder, and put a strategy forward to say, well, this is how we're going to respond to it. Okay, it's actually one of the downsides of a church environment that is highly prophetic is that words are coming in and out all the time, in and out all the time, and they're a bit like sugar hits. They just come, we hit them, they make us feel good, and then we forget about it because we're waiting for the next sugar hit to come. Now, I'm all for God speaking, and God's a big God, and He can say a million different things at once to a million different people, and that's absolutely fine. But when we truly value a prophetic word that has weight to it, we need to stop and think, and we go, well, if God's spoken that to me, what do we need to do to partner with that word? And so part of doing a Philippians series is not just because it's a good idea, it's an easy book, it's every preacher's favorite, it's four chapters, that'll be nice and quick, we can nail that over a winter season. No, this is a response to a word that God spoke to us as a church about the joy of the Lord being your strength. We have joy through the gospel and the book of Philippians is a great book to study and read over again and again when it comes to learning lessons about joy. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to be starting a series called Choose Joy. Choose joy. Now, I need you at home to do that whole preacher thing. Repeat after me, okay? Choose joy. Choose joy. Oh, overwhelmed. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Thank you, guys. So we're going to do that today. But what we're going to do to start this series in Philippians is we're not going to open to Philippians at all. Okay, I'm going to do that today. Because the book of Philippians has no... Has, the context of the letter to the Philippians only makes sense because of what happens in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, chapter 16, is where we see the Philippian church started. It is pioneered, it is planted, it is parented by a man called the Apostle Paul. And it is the Apostle Paul that writes the letter to the Philippians to them years later while he's under house arrest Okay, in Rome. He's writing to them from a place of confinement and he writes to them and he says, Listen, remember how I was when I was with you. He gives them a lot of instruction in the book of Philippians. We're going to be looking at some of them over the next couple of weeks. But he does it on the basis of the fact that he walked with them, lived with them, ate, drank and uh, 
slept in the same area as them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Live, camera, live, what can you do? And he said, and he said, listen, I modeled this for you. So any instruction he gave is, is, is modeled for us in the book of Acts. So as he writes a letter, you can see that he has practiced what he was preaching, okay? And he demonstrated it to them. So what I want to do today is I want to walk through the story of Acts chapter 16. Some of it's going to be quite well known to you. I'm just going to read it like a story. Much of it I'm going to speak, uh, read quite fast, so keep up with me on the screen. And as we do that, I want to keep those three things in mind. Righteousness, peace, and Joy. I want to see how Paul modeled these things in real life to the Philippians so that when over the next few weeks we read the letter he then wrote to them and he encourages them in righteousness, he encourages them in peace and he most importantly he encourages them to choose joy. It's because he first modeled it to them and that's what we're going to see in Acts 16. Are you ready at home? Are you ready to engage with me today? Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the good teacher today and you take a printed word on paper. You take a word from a guy that's been up early and had too many coffees already today and you bring it as a living and active word to our hearts and our minds. No matter where we are, no matter where we're watching this today, Holy Spirit, we pray that your supernatural presence would touch the hearts and the minds of your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go. Acts chapter 16. I'm going to read from verse Six, as we look at our, begin our series, Choose Joy. Acts 16, 6. The Holy Spirit had forbidden Paul and his partners to preach the word in the southern western provinces of Turkey. So they ministered throughout the region of central and west central Turkey. Isn't that interesting? The Holy Spirit forbade them. Next verse. When they got as far west as the borders of Mysia, they repeatedly attempted to go north into the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to enter. I read this this morning and I thought, I wonder if we could remember the last time the Holy Spirit forbade me to do something. When's the last time you could say, you know what, I wanted to do something and the Spirit of Jesus would not let me? This is part of his ministry. The Holy Spirit forbade us to do something that we were leaning towards, that we were walking in that direction, and he said, no. Isn't that interesting language there? Very strong. So instead, verse 8, they went right through the province of Mysia to the seaport of Troas. While staying there, Paul experienced a supernatural, ecstatic vision during the night. A man from Macedonia appeared before him and pleaded with him, please, you must come across the sea to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen this vision, we immediately prepared, immediately prepared to cross over to Macedonia, convinced God himself was calling us to go and preach the wonderful news of the gospel to them. Righteousness, peace and joy. You know what righteousness is when it's lived out? It's basically doing the right thing. The right thing to do is the right thing to do. And in the context of our Christian faith, righteousness is is doing what God says. Yeah. Is saying go when he says go and saying no when he says no. And this is exactly what Paul is modeling here, a lifestyle of obedience to the Holy Spirit's moving, a lifestyle of obedience to God's word. I go when he says go. Even if it's in the middle of the night and I wake up and I get my team together and I say, quick, quick, we've got to get on the first ship out of here at, first, in dawn, at dawn. Immediate obedience. I go when he says go and I say no when he says no. Here is Paul living out a righteous lifestyle. He has encountered the righteousness of God. He's experienced it, God's holiness. He was gifted righteousness the moment he believed on Jesus. God holds nothing against me anymore. I stand right in his eyes in love. Case is closed against me. God's got nothing against me. I am righteous in his sight. I embrace that gift. And now I commit myself to living out righteousness and exhibit it and express it to other people. And this is a great picture to see here of Paul's instant obedience. Go when he says go. No when he says no. Because later on, when he writes to the Philippian church, this is where he's going. He's headed to Philippi now. 
when he writes to the Philippian church, he will be instructing them to obey God no matter what he says, to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and to do what he says, and here's Paul exampling it for them. I'm not just preaching something. I've practiced what I've been preaching. Let's keep reading. From Troas, after this vision, okay, we sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis. Finally, we reached Philippi. Here it is, Philippians, Philippi, a major city in the Roman colony of Macedonia, and we remained there for a number of days. When Saturday came, we went outside the gates of the city to a nearby river, for there appeared to be a house of prayer and worship there. Sitting on the riverbank, we struck up a conversation with some of the women who had gathered there. One of them uh, was Lydia, a businesswoman from the city of Thyatira, who was a dealer of exquisite purple cloth and a Jewish convert. While Paul shared the good news with her, God opened her heart to receive Paul's message. She devoted herself to the Lord, and we baptized her and her entire family. Afterward, she urged us to stay in her home, saying, since I'm now a believer in the Lord, come and stay in my house. And so... We were persuaded to stay there. It just occurred to me this morning, reading this, what does it take for a group of men traveling? There's no indication that Paul had uh, females or any wives or anything on his, on his team as he was traveling at, at this point. They were all men. They go to a place where there's a group of women who are of, of a different race to them. They strike up a conversation different gender, different race, strike up a conversation, Lydia's heart is opened and Lydia's house is opened. Lydia was a type of person, a successful businesswoman. It doesn't indicate she was married here. She may have been, but it doesn't indicate that she was. This was the type of person you... Uh, she's got experience in life. It's not easy to pull the wool over her eyes. I think Lydia experienced here a true man of peace, Crossed gender lines, not an issue. Crossed race lines, not an issue. Heart was open. House was open. Because Paul was a man of peace. We've got people in our society that want us to believe that it is impossible to have peace between genders. There's always going to be a battle of men and women. We have people in our society that want us to believe it would be impossible to have peace among race. There will always be racial... You know, an easy solution to that, to be people of peace. It's not that hard. And here's Paul with a group of men, foreigners, a diff different ethnicity to this woman. Her heart is opened. Her home is opened. Because, I believe, she found a man of peace, a, f a man that could be trusted a person of integrity and a person who carried peace with him everywhere he goes. Righteousness, peace and joy. Only a man of peace could do that. Let's keep reading. Verse 16. One day as we were going to the house of prayer, we encountered a young slave girl who had a spirit of divination, the spirit of Python. She earned great profits for her owners by being a fortune teller. She kept following us, shouting, These men are servants of the great high God and they are telling us how to be saved. Free advertising, okay? Nothing wrong with that. What she said, perfectly accurate. She's spruiking for them, doing them a favor, surely. Verse 18. Day after day, she continued to do this until Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit indwelling her, I command you in the name of Jesus, the anointed one, come out of her now. At that very moment, the Spirit came out of her. Here is a man of peace, Paul, who was getting annoyed, who was getting agitated, who was at unrest. Everything this woman said was true. It was accurate. These men are represented the Most High God and telling you how to be saved. Well, amen, sister. That's absolutely right. Every word you said is accurate. And yet day after day, Paul was losing his peace. He felt an unrest. He knew he was agitated. He was deeply disturbed. And he knew something is not right here. Most every one of you at home knows exactly what that's like. 
that gut feel, that feeling in your waters, that feeling in your spirit that my peace has gone, something's disturbed me and it all looks fine on the outside but there's something not quite right about this. Well, Paul is a man of peace. He's not a reactionary. After days of discerning, after days of watching and listening and having that peace being disturbed within him, he suddenly knew what the issue was and he dealt with it there and there. God, this lack of peace got his attention. And this is one of the reasons that we really need to be a people that commit ourselves to peace. What, what are you talking about, Chad? I started by talking about the culture of heaven, okay? Righteousness, peace, and joy. These are things we experience from God. These are things we embrace as a gift. And then these are things we commit ourselves to exhibiting and expressing. And one of the reasons we need to be a people of peace is so that when genuine unrest comes, we can discern it. Because if we are constantly at unrest... We will never be able to discern when a true problem comes up. You see, there are also people in our society that do not want us to live peacefully. Because when you live at peace, when you have a clear mind, you make wise and clear decisions. But when you have someone that wants to sell you something, this is how marketing works. In order to sell you something, one of the ways we purchase things and buy things is often on impulse. And so marketing people make us feel agitated, make us feel fearful, make us feel afraid, make us feel like we're going to miss out on something. And so we, in impulse, spend money, give us money, and they need to keep that cycle going. It is in the best interest of certain people to keep our society at unrest, to make us afraid that toilet paper is going to run out at any given moment and then be afraid about something else and then afraid about something else and then angry about something else. No, 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 no. God is calling us to live in a place of peace. So that when genuine crises do happen, we're not always on edge and on edge, on edge. We can watch and discern and see whether this is a genuine issue or not. It is so important that we live with that peace that passes understanding, as he says in the book of Philippians, that we can live with that peace so that we can be discerning when true problems arise. And everybody said, I'll think about that over lunch. Okay, there we go. Paul lost his peace. What's the point, Chad? The point is this. Paul exampled what it was to live righteously. What he says goes. When he goes, I go. When he says no, I say no. So he can write his letter to them later and say, now you obey Jesus just as I have. Paul also modeled what it was to be a man of peace so that when he can write to the Philippians later, he can say to them, listen, don't be anxious about... Come on, don't be anxious about anything but in every situation pray petition offer request to god so that his supernatural peace will guard your heart and guard your mind paul did not just pen that to them don't be anxious he modeled it for them first that's what we see and that's why we're looking here in the book of acts last thing we're going to be moving on to joy righteousness Peace and now joy with everybody's favorite story from verse 21. Let's go. When her owners realized that their potential of making a profit had vanished, they forcefully seized Paul and Silas, dragged them out of the city square to face the authorities. When they appeared before the Roman soldiers and magistrates, the slave owners leveled accusations at them, saying, These Jews are troublemakers. They're throwing our city into confusion. They're pushing their Jewish religion down our throats. It's wrong and unlawful for them to promote these Jewish ways, for we are Romans living in a Roman colony. Can you see that kind of, uh, that sort of ethnic racism essentially coming out? Okay, these, It's us and them, us and them. And these Jews have, are, are causing problems in our city by bringing some inferior culture and way of thinking. A great crowd gathered, and all the people joined in to come against them. Basically, a mob formed. The Roman officials ordered that Paul and Silas be stripped of their garments and beaten with rods on their bare backs. We find out later that this was perfectly illegitimate. <laughs> they had no right to do this because Paul was a Roman citizen. But these Roman officials did not follow the letter of the law. They did not go according to due process. 
here with Paul and Silas, because they had pressure put on them from the emotional mob and they made a rash decision and it embarrassed them later on. We'll keep reading. Verse 23, after Paul and Silas were severely beaten, they were thrown into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them securely. Securely. The jailer placed them in the innermost cell of the prison, had their feet bound and chained. Paul and Silas, undaunted, prayed in the middle of the night and sang songs of praise to God. Come on at home, why don't you say praise? praise? I can hear you, that's awesome. They sang songs of praise to God while all the other prisoners listened to their worship. I'll pause it there for a moment. Here we see righteousness, peace. We now see joy exhibited and expressed by the Apostle Paul and Silas when they sing songs of praise. The word here in the Greek uh, for praise comes from the word hymnos. Okay, obviously, there you go. So we get our word hymn from that. But listen, the word hymnos was not a Jewish term. It wasn't a Christian term. It wasn't a religious term, actually. The word hymnos meant a song of celebration. When a king would come back from war in, in, in Roman times or in the Greek language, they would sing victory songs as the king came in and they were called hymnos. Okay, They were called hymns. When heroes, when they would sing songs of celebration to their gods on their different public holidays, they would sing hymns. This was a celebration song. Paul and Silas are not singing mellow, sort of laid-back type of somber songs here in prison. They are singing songs of celebration. They are singing songs of praise, and that requires joy. That takes joy to do that. And I want to tell you, we, our whole worship team, or a good part of our worship team is here today. One of the frustrations that we have as worship teams, and many other pastors share this, is trying to find happy, rejoicing, joyful songs ar- around the place. You know, somber songs, quiet, swirly type of songs, are a, a dime a dozen. They're, they're everywhere. But to get a song of praise, a song that has joy and happiness behind it, that actually, it's a really hard thing to do. I remember seeing uh, Russell Evans from Planet Shakers about a year or so ago. I was in a meeting with him up in Adelaide, and he said the same thing. He said he sat down with his crew, the Planet Shakers crew. They're well known for their music globally, okay? And he said, listen, we need to get some energies back into our songs again, guys. We've gone mellow, you know? We, that's fine. Those songs have a place, but there is a place for singing songs of praise and celebration because sometimes in the darkest hour, at the darkest time of night, in the cell, when you're locked up and you're chained and there's stuff dripping down the walls and you've been severely flogged and severely beaten and life is unfair. It's not in those moments that the somber song is best for you. Oh, well, that expresses my mood at the time. Well, guess what? Sometimes we need to express the opposite mood and the opposite mood to that is celebration. And that's what these men sang. They sang songs of celebration, like when you celebrate a king, celebrate a God. They celebrated Yahweh in in their stocks, singing songs of praise. They were happy songs. They were joyful songs. And you know this because anyone who's been a Christian for longer than a year has heard this story preached. And you know the whole picture here of external circumstances not determining our joy. Happiness comes from circumstances, but joy comes from within. Joy comes because we've experienced the God who is the God of joy, who who rejoices over us with singing. We've, We've received joy in the gospel. It's been a gift that's been given to us. Part of the fruit of the Spirit that's living in you is the Spirit of joy. He is there. The Spirit of joy is within you. Our job is to choose joy in the darkest hours, to choose joy in these times and say, I'm going to choose those songs to sing at this particular point in time. They sang happy songs in their darkest time and in their darkest hour when injustice was against them, when they had been mistreated and abused, they came in the opposite spirit and rejoiced in the things that were not changed. They were chained. 
But certain things were unchanged and unchained. And that was the joy that was within them. And so this is why. What has Paul done? He's demonstrated his integrity, his, his, his ability to go when he says go, no when he says no. So he writes to the church later and he says, listen, you obey Christ just as, if, as you've seen me done. He's demonstrated what it is to be a man of peace so that later on he can write to them and he could say, you know, you've watched me do this. Now you guard your heart and your mind in the peace of God by not being anxious about anything. He's practiced what he is preaching and now he is demonstrating to them what it is like to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He writes that to them because he first modeled it to them. That's why we're looking at Acts 16 today and this is what happened after they sang those songs. Suddenly, verse 20 something, 6 Verse 26. Verse 26? Yeah, verse 26. I just needed to calm down a bit there. That's... No, I'm, no, I'm fine. I'm just like, people are just like, I can see them. They're, they're going wild at home. They're like on their chairs and I'm like, I just need to give people at home a, a chance to calm down. Anyway, suddenly, here we go. Stop rolling your eyes, I can see you. Suddenly, a great earthquake shook the foundations of the prison. I wonder how many of you know what it's like to feel like your foundations are being shaken. Suddenly, a great earthquake shook the foundations of the prison. All at once, every prison door flung open and the chains of all the prisoners came loose. Startled, the jailer awoke and saw every cell door standing open, assuming that all the prisoners had escaped. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself when Paul shouted in the darkness, Stop! Don't hurt yourself. We are all here. Darkness, dust, manic, maybe noises and screams all around of this massive earthquake. We don't know what damage it had done in the city. It had done enough damage to open, fling open secure doors and break off chains. That's a pretty violent earthquake. I'm going to suggest there was a lot of noise going on and yet here we see the man of peace in the darkness saying, it's okay. Paul, like Jesus on the boat during the storm, peaceful. And he brought peace through his words in that situation. The jailer called for a light. When he saw that they were still in their cells, he rushed in and fell trembling at their feet. Then he led Paul and Silas outside and asked, what must I do to be saved? I've heard you singing songs tonight. I've heard in the lyrics of the songs you're singing about a salvation that is available, that you have received. I want to know about it as well. They answered, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and all your family. Then they prophesied the word of the Lord over him and his family. Even though the hour was late, he washed their wounds. Then he and all his family were baptized. He took Paul and Silas into his home, set them on his table and fed them. The jailer and all his family were filled with joy in the newfound faith in God. He had, ex he had experienced joy from Paul. He'd heard it through the walls. He now embraced that joy for himself when he took on Jesus. And this man was now committing himself to be a joy carrier for the rest of his life as well. At daybreak, the magistrates sent officers to the prison to say to the jailer, let the two men go. The jailer informed Paul and Silas, the magistrates have sent orders to release you. You're free to go now. They don't want you here anymore. I think everyone's freaking out a bit. But Paul told the officers, no, we're not going anywhere. They had us beaten in public without a trial. We're Roman citizens, don't you know? Do you think we're just going to walk quietly away after they threw us in prison, violated our rights? Absolutely not. You go back and tell the magistrates, they need to come down here and escort us out. We are staying put here in the prison until they walk us out through the gates publicly. One of the reasons you read whole Bible stories is because sometimes we develop myths about stories and we misremember how they actually go. When the earthquake hit the prison, it wasn't so that the prisoners could escape. No prisoners escape. Paul says that explicitly. He says, we're all here, mate. 
We're staying put. See, Paul, even in this opportunity of open doors, literally open doors, with the jailer now being his friend, able to, if he wanted to, to smuggle him out at night, Paul was still a man of righteousness because it was not right for Paul to leave. It was not right for him. It was not a, an issue of integrity for him to escape from prison would have meant that he would have been a fugitive for the rest of his life with a record against him and would never have been allowed back into Philippi to minister or preach the gospel again. As hard as it was, as tempting as what it might have been to run away from prison from these people that have beat me illegitimately, Paul said, no way. You come and escort me out publicly so everyone can see I'm innocent. You come and escort me out so my integrity is intact in the eyes of other people because my reputation long-term in this city means more than a quick fix. And he kept that man of peace and that man of integrity and that man of joy somehow convinced hardened criminals to stay put as well. Not one murderer, rapist, theft or violent criminal was out on the streets that night because there was a man there that carried the culture of the kingdom, that carried joy. <laughs> despite the situation, was able to rejoice in God's salvation, that carried peace, that brought peaceableness in an absolute manic situation and that brought integrity when there was a lot of room to do the wrong thing. What an amazing, amazing character. We look at a man who is just a normal Christian, the Apostle Paul. And so later, what's your point, Chad? Later, he can write back to the Philippians, having exampled these things to them, and he can instruct them confidently with the things he does because he has practiced what he preached. Let's finish the story. When the officers went back and reported what Paul and Silas had told them, the magistrates were freaked out, especially on hearing that they'd beaten two Roman citizens without due process. Oops, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't have listened to the voices of the mob Maybe we should have calmed down first and done some due process and research ourselves before we reacted to the loud voices around us. Good lesson. <laughs> Don't act with haste, ladies and gentlemen. So they went to the prison and they apologized to Paul and Silas, begging them repeatedly, please leave the city now. Please leave the city. So Paul and Silas left the prison, went back to Lydia's house. They didn't walk out of the city straight away. They prioritized relationship before the next thing. They went back to Lydia's house. So we know we, 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 we want to get out of here, but we're going to go see our friends first. They met with the believers. They comforted and encouraged them before departing because integrity, peace, and joy was not just something that Paul was happy to experience for himself. He wanted the Christian community also to have that peace and that joy and that righteousness, having seen that he was well after that beating. Isn't that a great story? Yeah. The kingdom of heaven is not about eating, drinking, and all externalities. God's culture, God's kingdom, what God is like and what the environment around him is like is righteousness, peace and joy. And these are things that He is. These are things that He gives us as gifts. And these are things that we are called to choose to example and exemplify in our life. Joy is a gift, but it's also a choice. Peace is a gift, but it's also a choice. Righteousness is a gift. And then living it out, is a choice and over this winter season I want to particularly focus on joy and encourage you to choose joy in all circumstances in January on the Australia Day long weekend we spoke about the privilege of being a citizen of Australia today Queen's birthday we celebrate as it were the privileges of being part of the uh, British Empire or at least having that British history but first and foremost, friends, we are citizens of heaven. In fact, it's the book of Philippians, can you believe it, where that term is coined, Philippians 3 verse 20. We are citizens of heaven. We are members of another citizenship. And so as I wrap this up today, let me just highlight again those three things. Joy, number one, is something that God is. Psalm 16 says, In His presence is fullness of joy. Where God is, there is joy, because God is joyful. <laughs> He's a happy God, all right? 
He's a happy God. Joy is something to be experienced because it's who He is. Secondly, joy is something to be embraced as a gift because it comes to us in the gospel. The gospel of Jesus is good news and that comes with it the gift of joy. The Holy Spirit who's given to us, the evidence of His work in our life is love, peace, joy. The joy-filled love is what it is. And thirdly, joy is a choice. It's who God is. It's a gift that He gives us. And thirdly, it's a choice for us to example and exhibit in our life. And whether you are visiting with us today, but especially for those of you who are part of our Bayside Church family, I want to encourage you today not just to hear a sermon from stories that we've heard before in Acts 16. Oh, that was an interesting take. I've never quite seen that before. No, don't do that. Understand that seven, eight, nine months ago, the Lord spoke to us, gave us a prophetic word and said, in this year, a pivotal lesson that we'll need to embrace is to know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. As we require strength and courage, was the other word Jay had, joy and courage. As we require strength and courage for this year, understand that one of the keys to walking in that is by walking in joy. It's who God is, so spend time with Him. It's a gift He's given you, so appreciate it. Tell yourself, remind yourself you already have joy. And thirdly, choose to rejoice. Rejoy, go back to joy. Re-return to joy, because joy is always there and available to you. I'm going to leave it there today. It's a public holiday, so I'm going to let you go early. Have an early minute. But I do want to give you some homework this week. Your first thing is to read Philippians. As I said, I read it through in one sitting, just read it through as a letter. It took me less than 10 minutes. Do that this week. Do it a few times. Read it in depth. Read it quickly. Read the book of Philippians. Many of you could do that even right now after this service. Do it today. Having heard the Acts story, the content of the letter will now make a lot more sense to you now that you've seen that story. I believe, believe me when I say that. And the second thing I'd like you to do this week is your homework. Is Every day when you wake up, remind yourself of those three things. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Thank God for them. Hey Lord, today I wake up as a citizen of Australia. I wake up as a citizen of a Western nation. I wake up as a citizen of a developed nation. But today I wake up as a citizen of heaven. Today I live in righteousness, peace and joy. Today I thank you that you are full integrity, the God of all peace and the God of unspeakable joy and full of glory. I thank you that you give these things to me. And I thank you today that I walk in them to the best of my ability, righteousness, peace, and joy, so that other people around me can see what God is like. I'm excited about this winter series. I think it's going to be good for us, and I know that God is going to speak some things today. I trust that was helpful for you. How about you, five or six people that are here today? That was fine. Guys, bless you. Enjoy the rest of your long weekend, particularly, as I said, if you're visiting down here today enjoy get outside and uh, support local businesses as well uh, we'd love to see you do that we've got some great businesses down here but uh, enjoy your time we're here sunday morning every uh, weekend at 10 o'clock streaming more and more and more we're going to have more and more people in this room as the weeks go on we're going to make some decisions about that what that looks like uh, fairly shortly but until further notice we'll see you again 10 a.m here bayside church international tune in again it'd be great to see you god bless I hope you've enjoyed today's message. Remember to check us out at baysidechurch.org.au and of course, if you're ever in the area, please pop in and say good day.